call this meeting to order. Will the secretary please call the roll? Mr. Abraham? Here. Ms. Bauman? Excused. Ms. Como? Here. Dr. Cooper Stoll? Here. Dr. Jimenez? Here. Ms. Leahy? Excused. Mr. Lee? Excused. Mr. Corberg? Here. Mr. Spivey? Absent. A quorum of the Board of Education is present, so the regularly scheduled meeting of July 19th, 2021 is called to order. We recognize that the Hogan Administrative Center occupies the land of the Ho-Chunk people. Please take a moment to celebrate and honor this ancestral Ho-Chunk land and the sacred lands of all indigenous peoples. We will now have the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand and face the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Motion to approve the agenda is presented. Second. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, with a motion by Mr. Korberg and a second by Ms. Como, we will move to approve the agenda as presented. May I, uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion has carried. I believe nobody is registered to speak this evening. So we will move on to the approval of the superintendent's consent agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the superintendent's consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> With a motion by Mr. Korberg and a second by Ms. Como, uh, the items on the superintendent's consent agenda are approved as presented unless there is anybody uh, who disagrees. Hearing none, we'll move on to the approval of the board consent agenda. And both consent agendas are a mechanism used by the board to deal with routine business that comes before the body. Are there any items that we need to remove from the board consent agenda? Okay, I'll accept a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the uh, board consent agenda. Second. With a motion by Mr. Korberg, seconded by Ms. Como, the items on the board consent agenda are approved as presented unless anybody has a reason to um, say that they would like a vote. Hearing none, let's move on to the annual academic standards notice. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Engel. Um, so annually, we um, must approve academic standards by state law. And so this is the time at which the school board traditionally does so. It has to be the first meeting after July 1st. Uh, we presented those academic standards uh, last month for information. And so um, seeking approval of the academic standards for the 21-22 school year. Make a motion to approve the academic standards for the 21-22 school year as presented. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. So moved by Ms. Como, seconded by Mr. Abraham to adopt the Wisconsin academic standards in all discipline areas under section 11830 sub 1G sub A sub 1 of the state statutes for the 2021-2022 school year. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion has carried. And now we will move on to the resolution authorizing and approving the transfer of real property and a temporary limited easement to the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. Dr. Engel? Um, anytime we involve things of this nature, it requires board action. I can let uh, Ms. Sprang explain in more detail. Sure, so they're putting in a roundabout, right, uh, by Southern Bluffs Elementary. And our sign is a little bit on the property. So they're, they're buying that sliver and we are um, maintaining our sign, but we're going to move it back. So um, that is what is happening. So it's probably a good idea because we're, there's a lot of new homes across the way um, on the highway. So wonderful. So is there a motion 
<laughs> Pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 12044, 12013 sub 3, and 12013 sub 19M, the motion would be that the Board of Education of the District hereby authorizes and approves the transfer of the real property and a temporary limited easement to the Wisconsin Department of Transportation as described above and as shown on Project Plat 5163-07-20-4.01, recorded as document number 1750720. I think it's the so longest moved. motion ever. <laughs> so moved. Is there, so moved by Ms. Como and seconded by Mr. Korberg to do what I just said, uh, the <laughs> to approve the transfer of the real property and a temporary limited easement as described earlier. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And, uh, a roll call vote. Oh, we do need a roll call vote. Okay, so then uh, thank you for that. Can I have, Kelly, could you do that for us? Certainly. Mr. Abraham? Aye. Ms. Como? Aye. Dr. Cooperstoll? Aye. Mr. Korberg? Aye. And Dr. Jimenez? Aye. Motion has carried. Thank you. Next, we will move on to our information uh, section and we will look at Operational Expectation Monitoring Report OE8, Communicating With and Support for the Board. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Engel. Excellent. So, um, Operational Expectations Monitoring, this is part of the Board's critical job to ensure that we're monitoring policies and holding administration accountable for the policies that the Board has in place. Um, OE8 is related to communicating and support for the Board. So the superintendent shall ensure that the board is fully supported and adequately informed about matters relating to board work and significant district concern. Uh, and then there's a series of objectives listed below, 13 of them. So I'll um, talk through um, those briefly uh, and highlight a couple of things. So OE 8.1 is the superintendent will submit required monitoring data in a thorough, accurate, and understandable fashion according to the board's annual work plan schedule and including both superintendent interpretations and relevant data to document compliance or reasonable progress. So we've included uh, the board docs record of results and operational expectations monitoring reports um, and also some examples uh, for OE monitoring and results monitoring that have been submitted to date. And then we've also indicated that we would utilize the board's annual work plan and submitted GC6E um, and a tracking document that includes links to all of those monitoring reports. Uh, we feel that that uh, makes us compliant in following that monitoring process. OE 8.2, the superintendent will provide for the board in a timely manner information about trends, facts, and other information relevant to the board's work. The first measure is in matters of urgent issues or imminent media coverage, the superintendent provides timely updates to the Board of Education. Um, listed here as evidence are news articles, masking guidance, long-range facilities plans, uh, MOUs um, for the SRO, program, city tax inserts, central mascot, various um, matters that the school board has been communicated with to be uh, made, available, made aware of these issues as they come up. Indicator two, in communication with the Board of Education, the superintendent provides relevant information. And so this identifies workshops where topics were brought up with relevant information provided to the Board of Education, including roles and responsibilities, long-range facility planning, coherent governance, uh, performance expectations, uh, reopening plans. So, And there's also an additional piece of evidence, um, a compliance uh, documentation letter indicating the board was provided uh, uh, weekly updates um, via email from the superintendent. OE 8.3, the superintendent will inform the board of significant transfers of money with funds, within funds or other changes substantially affecting the district's financial condition. Um, Indicator one is the superintendent informs the board of significant transfers. Um, we did not have any significant transfers of money within funds. Um, the school board did approve end of year budget transfers and we listed those there. Um, while those were in excess of $250,000, they didn't technically meet that criteria, but I wanted to make sure that there was transparency there as it relates to uh, large sums of money in the school district. Um, OE 8.4, superintendent will ensure the board has adequate information from a variety of internal and external viewpoints to ensure informed board decisions. 
the indicator one, provide adequate information for board members to fulfill their elected responsibilities. Um, we identify monitoring reports, uh, the SRO report, long range facilities planning information, strategic plan for educational equity, um, all of which helped the board fulfill their elected responsibilities. Um, the superintendent considers a variety of viewpoints in communication to the Board of Education. Uh, we identify the district leadership team and policy review committee, providing uh, feedback and insight on policies and procedures. We also identify um, in developing the strategic plan for educational equity, a variety of groups that um, the superintendent and others met with to um, gain input to create that, uh, that document. Stop me along the way if you have questions or want clarification, but I'm going to keep on otherwise. OE 8.5, the superintendent will advise the board of changes and assumptions upon which board policy has been established. There were no major changes of assumptions per that definition there. OE 8.6, the superintendent will inform the board of anticipated significant media coverage. Um, the indicator is there are no complaints that the board was uninformed about wide-scale media coverage. Um, this one was kind of interesting. What does like significant media coverage include? And so using that definition listed above appear in the local media, including newspaper, radio, and television, um, we did not have any complaints about being uninformed about those issues. Um, OE 8.7, the superintendent will if in the superintendent's opinion, the board or individual members have encroached into areas of responsibility assigned to the superintendent, or if the board or its members are non-compliant with any of its GCBSR policies, the superintendent will inform the board <laughs> using the following process. This is an awkward one. Uh, if I don't think the board's doing the right thing, but uh, regardless. <laughs> um, so the superintendent reports specifics of any significant non-compliance with GC or BSR uh, policies. Uh, there were no significant non-compliance from my perspective as a superintendent. Uh, and then indicator two, the superintendent forms the board if individual members uh, encroach into areas of responsibility assigned to the superintendent. I did not report any incidents of that either. So a zero for both of those. Um, OE 8.8, .8, the superintendent will present information in simple and concise form, indicating clearly whether the information is incidental, intended for decision preparation, or for formal monitoring. Um, and our measure is board agendas are organized, so the agenda items are clearly organized for communication of monitoring results or compliance or for action. I think our agendas are very well organized and have indicated a link to board docs showing how they are. Uh, it's pretty clear what the expectation is. And I think in recent months, I've gotten better about clarifying even those individual action items about why it's being presented and what the action that the board has to take is and why. Um, indicator two, superintendent presents information in a simple and concise form, indicating clearly whether the information is incidental, uh, intended for decision preparation or formal monitoring. And evidence, um, we give uh, organization of uh, board agendas, um, we present, uh, the information presented for monitoring reports is listed there. Uh, the three-year summary. Um, oh, goodness, I lost my spot. Let's see, 8.8. .8. And um, items that were non-monitoring but required, um, there's notes there on what the expectation is and why they're presented. Um, OE 8.9, the superintendent will treat all members impartially and ensure that all members have equal access to information. Um, I attached a compliance documentation letter indicating that materials for board meetings and workshop sessions were presented to all members at the same time. Um, OE 8.10, the superintendent will inform the board in a timely manner of any actual or anticipated noncompliance with board operational expectation policy or any anticipated failure to achieve reasonable progress towards any results policy. Uh, once again, we included that monitoring process and that two OE policies uh, were categorized as in compliance with exceptions. So we're identifying that we did not make the progress we uh, wanted to. Uh, 
Um, OE 8.11, provide the board adequate information about all administrative actions and decisions that are delegated to the superintendent but required by law to be approved by the board. Um, there are a series of actions where this happens and we've identified those and linked to those board agendas, including approval of budget amendments, adoption of academic standards like we did today and at the same time last year, uh, and employee handbooks and others. Absolutely. Um, OE 8.12, the superintendent will inform the board in a timely manner of the final disposition of complaints referred to the superintendent by the board. There were no complaints brought to the superintendent by the board, uh, and a compliance law letter indicates that. And then the superintendent will inform the board in advance of any deletions or additions to, a, to or significant modifications of any administrative policies and or instructional programs. And despite lots of work on those this year, we have yet to formalize any of those changes <laughs> due to uh, lots of reasons. And so there are none to be updated as of yet, but will be many forthcoming. And that is OE8. There's a lot there. So please let me know if you have any questions, dispute any of our designations, or would like clarification on anything. So are there any comments or suggestions or of room for improvement, or is it, if everybody agrees with the superintendent's recommendation. So, are any questions or comments from the board at this point in time? I like yep. all the links. <laughs> uh, personally, I'm sorry. I like the links that you have there. So thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question, and it would include the the links as well. So, this is the first time that you've had an opportunity to submit the monitoring report for review, and as you know, part of this process and the reason behind why it comes forward for us as an information item is for us to be able to discuss that and also to be thinking about whether any changes might need to be made by the board going forward. And so now that you've had an opportunity to complete this um, report, are there things that you would like the board to consider in terms, because there is a lot here. Yeah. Are there mm -hmm. things that you would like the board to consider in terms of that policy as we evaluate that moving forward? Were, the, were there things that you thought might have, um, could be done better or if there were things that were redundant that uh, could be done where we don't, um, miss out on the important information that we need but could streamline it, that's something the board would always be interested in? I think a couple of the individual indicators that are listed are probably redundant. Uh, you know, we end up attaching the same compliance letter for both. We could probably streamline the indicator itself. The, all of the primary items, I think, are, are reasonable and what a board would want in terms of, um, understanding if you know you're getting the information you want it, you know a lot of it comes down to like I'm presenting information justifying that position but for this one in particular did you feel like you were communicated with is really your opinion you know so um, trying to generate the specific items that would demonstrate that you know is um, uh, challenging in some ways you know I it would be helpful, you know, almost if the board would provide, like, well, there's this time where I didn't feel like I was notified, you know, on time. You know, if I didn't hear that throughout the year, or, you know, oftentimes you're looking back a year, it's hard to remember. So this OE in particular, like, to get those dates, you know, I, I ended up reviewing every single board meeting that we had and looking at all the documents and agenda items. That was actually a really good process for me to kind of, like, review the year and go through that. And it, this timing actually works out pretty well for that. But... Um, Depending on what goes on in a year, it may be harder or easier to generate some of these lists, which is probably the challenge of every OE. I think like our financial one, you know, like those are pretty routine items. You know, you can identify where those are. Some of these you're trying to like remember, did I, did we communicate that? So I was like searching emails and, and other things. And so I would say it was, you know, maybe a little more time intensive, but not in a bad way. Um, other potential changes. The one that's kind of odd is the inform the board in a timely, or no, no. Yeah. <laughs> we, we discussed that thoroughly at coming up with these, and it really was in case we have a rogue person who decides to go directly to you and, and not follow the board procedures, we need to have that check on ourselves also. Because yeah. if we don't have that, somebody can just keep coming to you, and this way there's something within the policy that stops us from doing that. We have our chain of command and our process that we have to follow. You're just that check mark. 
Yeah, the question I have is, is this, through this process, is it the best way to inform the board that that has happened? You know, is it gonna be effective in like changing board activity? You know, so like normally, you know, if board member comes to me and says, hey, you need to change this policy now, or you need to let this kid have an exception, you know, I was like, whoa, you know, it's maybe not our role, let's talk about that. How can we like navigate this? If it's persistent, you know, then I would talk to the school board president and say, hey, I'm experiencing this from one of the board members, I need some help in, in managing this situation to then turn around and like be obligated to report that in a public setting feels a little awkward. Wasn't it that it had to be a policy in order for it to be enforced? It does have to be a policy. I think there can be some discussion about whether or not, I, th I think there's some confidentiality to be had yeah. with that clearly. So um, it, it, it might be that that addresses that sort of public nature of that. Um, but when Randy and Linda were here to guide us through the process, they felt it was so important to, they encouraged the incorporation of that as well to ensure that there is a formal means so that no one board member is treated, you could have two folks, for example, who violated, violated that policy but were treated differently in sure. the result of that. But I think there are ways that can be, we can think about how to do that. And I would even suggest at this point that the board consider um, how we want to then move, since you, since I've asked if mm -hmm. you had some suggestions and you do have some suggestions for us to think about, then I would, um, I think that we need to decide as a board whether or not if we want to then have you submit, you know, uh, that feedback to us. And then of course it would be up to the board president to schedule uh, that into an agenda for a discussion. Mm -hmm. But I think personally as a board member, then what the next step would be is if you would sort of codify what those that feedback so that we could review it as a board. But obviously as a board member, it's not my role to, to, to you know, ask you to do that specifically. So I'd be curious if other board members think that's the next best step is to have you provide that feedback so we can move forward. I think since it's the first time around, I, that makes sense to me. Well, and I think just looking back on our conversations, well, you were school board president and then with um, Dr. Jimenez as well, um, you know, what's the, What's the appropriate timeline? And I think, you know, we had discussed, do we kind of let everything get through twice almost? You know, and after we see it the second time, we'll have a, two points, you know, to really understand, like, is this appropriate? Is this not appropriate? And then that second time that we see it, I could see making, like, a formal recommendation, like, hey, here's some things that I would recommend from the administrative perspective for changes to the monitoring reports. And then at that time, the board would maybe address that on a rolling cycle moving forward. But you know, maybe giving it a year, you know, to... I would be happy to generate this report in its exact format again before, you know, the board goes, dives into, like, changing policy. <laughs> Well, I think that's also, but that's why this is also an opportunity for the board to decide whether or not they feel like the attachments that you included oh, yes. get at the spirit of what is intended by that policy. I think those two things go together. I have to tell you, I don't remember a conversation about two cycles going through okay. um, because in practice it should be one cycle. Yes. Um, so that means we would be at that moment now Absolutely. in terms of this one. Um but I think that that would be valuable feedback if you feel like you don't, you would recommend that nothing be changed and that it continue the way it is, then the board should take that into consideration as to whether or not they want to accept that moving forward. Yeah, just jumping in, you asked the question exactly that I had on my mind. You know, what are, how is this working? Is it working well? Is it not working well? What are suggestions for improvement that we can have? And so. Yeah, if you have some of those, I think this would be a prime time for us to look at that. I think your point is well taken about, I think it's 8.7, where we're looking at um, the potential, there could be a potential of a, of a confidentiality piece there, and at least we should have that conversation. Luckily, we didn't have anything to report, but we should definitely have the conversation yeah. on that point particularly. Maybe within that, not necessarily blurting out a name or blurting out, but yes, one incident occurred or... I agree with confidentiality. Nobody yeah. wants to get called out in the middle of, of a, a meeting, but it has to be noted that somebody potentially did cross that line. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, 
Unfortunately, there was no incidents of that this year. Yes. But I think it would be able to say, you know, five times, like I had a conversation with the school board president regarding an individual's actions. You know, I think I would also add, add that since this is the first cycle that we're going through, I think there is also some value if, 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 if you feel that even though there are places where changes could be made, obviously it's at the discretion of the board. However, the board is open to feedback that you have as a superintendent. So even if there are suggestions you have for improving this, but you think it would create more of a hardship than to go through it for one more cycle, then it's important for us to have that information too. It sounds like that's what you're saying, that it would be your at least hope that we would keep those indicators the same and then perhaps reevaluate it at another time. Yeah, I, I think it would be worth it to do it one more time to see if I have the same opinion next year. <laughs> and I am also interested in feedback, not just on the policy, but like is the evidence that is submitted sufficient, you know, for some of those items, you know, because this one is particularly, it's, it's less like I can point to the specific thing that meets that definition. It's more does the evidence I provide match your experience as far as being and feeling like you were informed, understanding those information items. You know, so I don't, hopefully as you read through this, it matched up with that, you know, and my assessment matches yours. But I think in this one in particular, there could be a, a difference in um, understanding as far as what those indicators are. So. Other comments from the board? So I'll just ask, you know, do, do we feel like we are in agreement in terms of compliance on this OE from the board? I don't have any issue with the Yeah. I don't either. Submission. Yeah, I don't, I don't either. I think that we would probably end up moving in compliance uh, for OE8. I, I would, you know, maybe that's something for us to consider still, though. I think the OE8.7 the confidentiality piece is just something that we should at least have a conversation, maybe not necessarily move to make a change, but at least have a conversation about whether there's something to be done there. Yeah, and I would, Dr. Jimenez, I think because it, that's a fairly simple change. Yeah. I mean, historically, if it's been something fairly minor and the conversation around the table has been that in a general agreement with that, I think that's something also that you could just bring forward sure. as a change. Um, and uh, then if there were any discussion at that time, but otherwise, I, something to approve. I'm not hearing any real pushback about adding okay. the confidentiality piece okay. to that. Yeah, so maybe Dr. Engel, you and I can have a conversation and then we can bring back our, our uh, conversation to the board at the next board meeting. Sounds good. Wonderful. Thank you very much, everybody, for the conversation. Uh, we will move on to the next agenda item, which is the Code of Conduct, Student Rights and Responsibilities. And Dr. Engel? So this is an item that we have traditionally bought before the school board, where it fits in exactly as far as a board responsibility versus administrative action has been a bit of a question. That said, we've traditionally presented this to the school board because it impacts so much of uh, our students' lives, including potentially even expelling them. You know, So that's where it starts to intersect in the school board's responsibility, and we wanna make sure that the board understands how we approach the code of rights and responsibilities, the process that we take in developing that, so that if it gets to the point where you have to be involved, it's not the first time you're hearing about the code of rights and responsibilities. And um, our uh, Kurt Teff will talk about um, the document, how it's developed. And first I'll let uh, Dr. Harsey add anything for context before Kurt gets going. No, I think that's a great introduction. We'll turn it over. Well, thanks uh, for having me tonight and a chance to talk a little bit about um, our Code of uh, Rights and Responsibilities. So in Wisconsin under statute, every school district needs to maintain some type of documents, typically called a Code of Conduct, that outlines student expectations and, and the like. Um, so our version of that, we call the Student Code of Rights and Responsibilities. It's been named that for a long, long time, um, over, over uh, almost 30 years. Um, and it's gone through a number of changes. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the changes that have happened because we have some new board members and the last few years um, have seen some of the most sizable change, changes. Um, 
one of the changes that we made is that this is now part of an annual review process. So um, back in 2019-2020, uh, um, one of the things that we recognized was there was just really not a strong process for review of the code uh, of conduct or code of rights and responsibilities. There wasn't a whole lot of involvement. Actually, if you look at the 2018-19 and, and um, you know, even almost uh, 30 years prior, code was substantively about the same, you know, nominal changes. And so one of the adjustments um, that we made was to make it an annual feedback process. Starts with kind of a focus in design. Um, so we take a look at some of the issues, some of the, some of the trends, um, some of the priorities that we hear about as we talk with students or as, as we talk with uh, families or community members. Um, we uh, work on planning and feedback, and so we've uh, done a lot of work in terms of identifying groups uh, to be able to meet with, to be able to get feedback. Um, we design and facilitate these sessions to get feedback from those groups. Uh, and then we try to pull all this information together, and you'll be able to see probably in the PowerPoint if you had a chance to review it. We've got a lot of feedback uh, from our community. Try to try to make sense of that and, and bring a little bit of order to that. and, and um, uh, integrated into our into our code. So, um, just hit a few highlights on some of the bigger uh, design changes over the years. So, 1920 was a, a pretty significant uh, uh, adjustment to our code of rights. Um, really, in terms of everything, from the way it looks to what in, what was included in it for our, for our new board members, um, our our previous codes really focused on you know essentially the, all the sorts of things kids can do to get in trouble and the, how we respond to that, and uh, a lot of it was um, outdated. So we updated a lot of that, updated the appeals process, um, which is included in our our code now. Um, f that after that first year that we were meeting with stakeholders, actually students came forward and said, you know, one of the uh, good area to focus on would be our uh, dress policy. And so last year, the big fo or the previous year, not last school year, 2020, 2021, our focus was around student dress. Uh, and we had uh, discussions with uh, families and, and students about that and updated our dress policy. And then this past year, really coming out of the uh, school resource officer report that doc, Dr. Engel had presented, um, we really felt it'd be appropriate to talk about a discipline philosophy, something that helped anchor the, the document that we could point to, you know, whenever a, a staff member or administrator is thinking about how should I handle this, really some principles to be able to uh, review so we can make good decisions for kids and families. Uh, this year was um, a unique year uh, because we were remote for so much of it, and so um, we uh, designed everything around compression planning. If you've had any experience with compression planning, it's really about intentional design of a meeting, knowing that we are meeting with so many stakeholder groups. Um, we were intentional about our purpose, our non-purpose, the questions that we were asking, the background that we gave them, um, so we could really have some, some focused discussion um, around the, the code. Um, you can see the design questions. We word it, we change wording for each of the groups a little bit differently, but the, uh, the, the general themes were things that don't work around discipline for kids or, make, or even make things worse sometimes. Uh, practices that are effective that we should try to expand or include, um, things that really seem to make a difference. Um, we also talked about limitations on the use of suspension, and we also talked about um, limitations on our use of law enforcement when, when we should have police in our schools. So you can see below that stakeholder groups, we met with a middle school group and a high school group, um, a couple different parent groups, a couple different community stakeholder groups, and then three staff uh, groups. And because of COVID, we did all this virtually. Uh, and so the next slide on this, um, we ended up using uh, Zoom and Padlet. Um, so Padlet's a phenomenal tool uh, uh, to be able to um, uh, collect feedback and, and get, get uh, input from folks. So what, what you'll see on that next slide is really a compression planning board. Uh, and it outlines, this I think was our middle school uh, group, uh, but outlines uh, the design of our time and, and um, then the focus questions that we had asked. Um, one of the nice things about um, Padlet is it does offer um, confidential ways for people to be able to give feedback on all the ideas that come forward, uh, which was excellent. And with Zoom, we had some students um, who were 
uh, participating who didn't feel comfortable sharing even in a Zoom context. We were getting private messages and things like that. So thankfully, Ami Zabrowski and Alicia Place uh, were helping to facilitate because it was. We had information coming in and ideas and, and trying to capture it all. Um, but uh, really, I felt like a, a positive, uh, positive experience for folks. And, and at the end of them, we always ask for feedback on the experience, and, and people felt it was, um, given the circumstances, a, a pretty smooth way to be able to visit. So, uh, the stakeholder feedback—you can see a big grid there. Um, and so, it, it, from a facilitation standpoint, um, we we took down what people shared. Uh, you know, it, it, and um, uh, kind of verbatim uh, captured uh, what input they had. Uh, but we did need to make sense of this because we had so much feed feedback across so many different topics. And what really emerged was um, uh, remarks around staff dispositions, um, how you know, uh, staff think about, feel about, interact with students, um, systems that we have in place to support student behavior and then the practices. Uh, and so that you can see in, in, in that grid, that's really how we organize the, the feedback and, and tried to find themes. So what you're seeing in this big grid is top ideas that came uh, by stakeholder group uh, and then, then by um, focus area. Uh, our new district discipline committee then took this grid and uh, we were actually able to meet in person. We met in the Hogan gym and had poster board up and you can see some pictures of the poster board. Uh, and we had this group go through and identify common themes across the groups and, and capture that. Um, the committee also identified other essential priorities. So, you know, maybe things that weren't common themes, but as a discipline committee, they really felt that were important to be able to include. Um, and out of that, we developed a draft of the uh, discipline philosophy to include um, in the code. Um, Biggest changes to the code uh, this year, um, pages three and four include our discipline philosophy, which is again organized around staff dispositions, um, systems, practices. Uh, and then with the feedback that we, we received um, on limitations of suspension and police involvement, we made some updates to the interventions and restorative responses on page 19. Um, and you can see you know, some, of the, some of the adjustment we, cleaned it up and tried to trim it down, um, but uh, most importantly, really reserved suspension for the most serious behaviors, which was just a really a common theme across um, all groups, um, this, the interest in working with students and working to keep them in schools. So um, final slide is uh, kind of an updated annual feedback uh, process. So really the only thing that's going to change moving forward is we, we will be working with the new committees, the district discipline committee, um, as well as the uh, anticipated SRO advisory committee um, uh, to really be able to help us uh, identify themes that we will have focused conversation around. Um, and so um, we'll, be, we'll be working with those groups and um, we've got a uh, discipline, district discipline committee meeting coming up and I know one of the focus topics that we're designing is parental involvement in the discipline process. It's very likely that could be you know, a potential focus for this year. So, uh, but all in all, um, uh, thought with, with COVID, felt like the feedback was positive, participation was, was great and um, we're proud of the code that uh, we were able to work with the community to, to help update this year. So with that, any questions? Any questions from the board? More of a comment. Um, it was nice actually going out to Skyward and registering my child and having a code of conduct booklet that you actually had to scroll through mm -hmm. so you'd actually you know see those grids of, oh, well, if my kid gets in trouble, here's a grid that tells me where to look or here's the the form that I need to fill out. And I also liked the code of conduct, I'm saying that word with quotes, um, for online meetings, mm -hmm. the, 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 what is required for online meetings. And so I appreciate that, that it is now um, not just a link to click on, but something you actually have to scroll through in order to get to the bottom and approve. So yeah. thank you for that. Excellent, thanks. Other comments? I have a question. Sure. So uh, is this a, like a living document? So for example, next year, I wouldn't, or in the next school year, I wouldn't anticipate a major redesign again, but 
if something comes up, is there, is, that, is there something in place where you can look at that and then implement changes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the annual process is to identify changes. So we'll take, you know, when we have these focused discussions, um, we'll take any feedback on the code and, and consider, consider changes. Um, the focus uh, really is just trends that we want to identify and incorporate. So, but yeah, we see it as, um, don't think it's perfect. Uh, it's gotten a lot better over the last three years, but, but we, we do want it to be representative of our community and our, our staff and our parents and students. So, yeah. How, how are the stakeholder groups selected? So, um, for the uh, parent groups, we're generally uh, working with the district-wide parents groups, uh, and then we're working with outreach groups. So Southside Moms United, we had uh, reached out to Northside Moms United, which is a community community group. Um, for community stakeholders, we had reached out to different organizations. We actually looked at some of the organizations who had spoke um, uh, as part of the forum for the SRO uh, feedback. Um, and ask them for you know folks who might want to participate or sit on those groups. Um, this year we did kind of keep those groups separate, so we had a community group and we had you know parent group kind of separately within that. Um, for the student groups, we ask um, principals to be able to identify students that are representative of their communities, uh, of their school community, um, and so that that's an important part, you know, making sure that there's representation on on those teams as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Other comments? Yeah. yeah. I have a comment and a, and a question. First of all, I um, appreciate the work that was done to bring in mul different groups to, mm -hmm. to provide feedback and that it was a collaborative and iterative um, process. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate the effort to develop a, a, a um, discipline philosophy to guide it. So I just want to thank you for your work on mm -hmm. that. Um, and the question I have, I don't know if it really should be addressed to you Kurt, or to um, the superintendent. But in thinking about this um, discipline philosophy that's now been developed, um, I'd like to know about the accountability piece to it. So is this something that is now going to be incorporated into administrative policy? Because um, it, it's a great philosophy, but how do we make sure that it is adhered to? So again, I don't know if it's one, both, I don't know who should answer that question. I'll give Kurt the first crack at it. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we're, we are um, talking with our administrative groups about this, so they, they've seen this document. And one of the things that we have been um, uh, talking with, uh, like our parents about, because that, that's one of the things that parents will bring up in their, in their sessions um, with us, is these experiences where they feel like things are, are happening um, uh, related to discipline, that they aren't necessarily being treated fairly, like they don't have a path to be able to address that. And so uh, one of the things that we are going to be developing, um, and, and this is more around parent advocacy, to make sure that they know there's a pathway to get resolution. Sometimes our folks aren't going to get right. Sometimes we're going to have staff do things that are not in alignment with our discipline philosophy, or we might even have an administrator that does something that's not in alignment. Um, we want to be able to make sure parents know what their their rights are, that they have the ability to appeal. So our appeal process is kind of outlined in there. Uh, and so last year, through our Project Aware grant, we started doing these positive foundations courses for parents, and they were mostly online. One of the offerings that we want to do is kind of a walkthrough of the code. Um, so kind of a, uh, just a, a conversation about the code, the intent behind it, the, the purpose behind it, and some feedback um, to parents about, you know, if you, if you ever run into this situation and you feel like the, there wasn't a fair resolution or, or weren't, weren't treated the way that you expected, that we bring resolution to that. And that was some feedback that we got from one of the community groups like a lot of words, great document, same thing, but how user-friendly is this to parents? And so that was one of our ideas, is could we turn this into somewhat of a conversation, a resource, so, so parents know, hey, this is, this is our agreement too. We've, we've committed to follow that through. So that'd be 
So that's, yeah, one avenue of accountability. The other is, you know, we want to ensure that all of our teachers see this, you know, so start of the year, you know, when we talk about discipline and how that happens, you know, our principals will work with teachers to ensure that they understand what this looks like. Not everyone necessarily agrees with every element of this, or maybe they do superficially, but in practice they haven't yet implemented some of these the way we would prefer. And so there'll be a learning curve, you know, for folks, but now that we have it written down, there's something we can refer to in our conversations with folks when they make a misstep or they're still adapting to, you know, what our expectations are. Um, first thing was to write it down. <laughs> uh, and then the second thing here, this at the beginning of this year is to let folks know, you know, like this is, these are our expectations and then give them an opportunity to work with that and then to, this year, you know, it'll be to implement it. And some of these like staff dispositions are, are difficult for some folks, you know, they haven't successfully done this every time historically. And so it'll be a, a work in progress, but now we have, you know, specific things to refer folks to and we'll be able to support them in their journey. Okay, so follow up to that. If I understand correctly then, if a parent feels that it has been violated. There is a process in place mm -hmm. for how they report that. Yeah. I guess then, to yep. the, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then, we are developing a process in place for then how to address that, or is there a process in place for how to address that? And there's the process we've always used in like addressing the issues that come up with staff. You know, so if a parent, you know, something a, a, a teacher interacts with a child, the parent feels that's unfair they let their principal know or another administrator, you know, there's a process in place for addressing that with the teacher. You know, it should be investigated by the administrator that supervises them and, you know, they should refer back to this document and talk about what expectations are. If it's egregious, you know, then there could be, you know, a series of disciplinary actions that could potentially be taken. But Do you think that there will be further policy or practices developed to, with a specific focus on these pieces just to further solidify that? For example, yeah. would that be part of a review process going forward? Yeah. So the challenge then would be to collect information in some way, you know, to understand how frequently folks aren't successful at complying with these expectations. And I think, unless it's a formal appeal, which we could collect if it was more casual, which happens, you know, like, I mean, it happens probably, I don't hopefully not regularly, but, you know, it's not infrequent that a parent calls and say, hey, like, this happened with my kid, what's the deal? And then the parent and the teacher work through it, and it's resolved in some manner, and, you know, sometimes there's apologies involved or, you know, remedies, but we wouldn't necessarily know about that beyond the, the building level, and so that would point to some sort of tracking system, which may be difficult, like when does it rise to that? Honestly, I think I'm just, I, I think the questions I'm asking are what mm. any parent mm. would ask with when reading this, which is, yeah, it's, there's a, the philosophy here, it's great that there's a mm -hmm. process in place for me to report it, but then asking what happens next and how this is going to be institutionalized in, into the district. Yeah. I, and I'm not saying that you, by the way, have to have all of those answers right mm -hmm. now, but we should expect those answers and Absolutely. have questions and have answers to them going forward. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine that if appeals got up to the next level, right? So let's say that something happens with a teacher or an administrator and it goes to the next level, that they ask for, you know, you know, redress in some way. If the parent's satisfied because it was dealt with in a way that they felt like addressed you know, our expectations, then it wouldn't go any further. You know, if it continues to be an issue where they feel unsatisfied, that's where it would be something we would want to take note of and record and follow up on. And, and I think where I'm really, what, what underpins my question is just um, to know that, or I assume since now we have codified this and written this down that we might expect, for example, professional development going forward oh, yes. would incorporate some of these specific elements. And I guess I'm just sort of looking for confirmation that this is what you, when I talk about like sure, sure, sure. bringing that in and changing mm -hmm. culture or yeah. those kind of things that I, that's what I'm looking for as part of that process is 
you know, I, I know you said that when the educators sh- sharing this is one piece of it, mm-hmm. but I think all of us know that there is more mm-hmm. training and professional development that probably yes. will be necessary around it. So and these concepts all align with our strategic plan okay. for educational equity, and all of our professional development is aligned with that strategy. So these things are in complete alignment with that larger strategy. They all nest. So everything a a teacher gets, you know, whether you're developing positive relationships, maintaining high expectations, seeking out restorative practices, those will all be incorporated into everything they do. So they'll be bathing in this philosophy Mm -hmm. in all of our professional development. (laughs) I think the only comment I would make is that I think most of our conversation is centered around teachers. I think it would be for all staff, correct? I mean, if we had uh, somebody who was a non-teacher who was not following this, there would be conversations. They would be receiving professional development, same with administrators. So it's all educational staff within the school district of La Crosse, correct? Absolutely. Our administrative assistants, our, our TAs, you know, those folks have as many opportunities to address student behavior as anyone. So absolutely, we want this. To, that's why it's staff dispositions, not just the teachers. You know, it includes us as administrators. Mm-hmm. If we go out to the buildings and we're dealing with folks, those same expectations are in place for us. Yes. You know, who are here at Hogan as mm-hmm. are in the buildings. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Any other comments from the staff? Uh, the staff from the board. <laughs> <laughs> Hearing none. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, we will move on to the next item, the 2021-2022 proposed budget and instructional priorities. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Engel again. Um, so this is part of our, um, one of Patty's OEs. I can't remember the one specifically, five, four, three. Uh, <laughs> It's built into our budget book. And so these instructional priorities indicate our financial priorities. And so that's why it's crucial that we let the board know about these because they support the development of that final monitoring report. And with um, some of our monitoring reports, we split them out over the course of the year so it's not overwhelming and all at once. And we want you to get this information when it's most pertinent. In this case, instructional priorities leading into the start of the school year is a great time to talk about those. And so with that, I will turn it over to to Patty if she has any words about how this fits in and then to Troy. I would just say that this is a great introduction to it because you will see it again. (laughs) (laughs) So I'll, I'll start by just saying, you know, fresh eyes on uh, kind of a, a document that's been around for a while is an exciting uh, opportunity. And so um, I'll just take uh, all of you back to several months ago when Dr. Engel came into my office and um, he must have been looking through the budget book and he said, Troy, I see the instructional priorities are part of the budget book. Yes, they are. And I see that there's, I don't know, 16, 18, 20 pages. And I'm excited at that point. Yes. And um, he he said those numbers to me again. There's 16, 18, 20 pages of instructional priorities. And it dawned on me he was looking for some synthesis of of the instructional priorities. We went through, and I let him know that all the program supervisors, they go through this wonderful exercise with their staff, and, you know, how do we get to those instructional priorities? And he said, that's wonderful. That is all. That's great. For the budget book, I would like this condensed. And so what you see before you tonight is, uh, Mr. Abraham, this is, this is probably for you, it's new, and, um, and I would say the same thing to any of the new board members. For the board members who've been here, you understand that this document was much, much longer historically. Um, we did, all of the program supervisors did a great job of actually condensing their work to what's linked in there to what is an eight-page document that you will see in September as part of OE11. Uh, But um, I do have just a couple of comments um, regarding these instructional priorities, uh, if you'll indulge me for just a couple of minutes here. Uh, You heard Dr. Engel in OE8 uh, reference the strategic plan. I will tell you that our instructional priorities, foundational, are all built on that strategic plan. Uh, that was presented to the board back on March 1st. We could stop the instructional priority conversation right there. However, um, I will tell you that um, there were a couple of other documents that helped 
uh, create some themes that if you were to click on that link of the eight page document, uh, you will see you know, throughout the work of the content area supervisors, supervisors of programs and directors of programs uh, that aligns just uh, amicably with the board's mission statements, uh, the administrative goals that Dr. Engel had brought forward uh, in May. Uh, and one of those other elements is early literacy. And we really feel like uh, that is work that's foundational to our district as well and clearly aligns well with the strategic plan for our district. And while we say early literacy and we're focusing on K-3, uh, that does not mean that we're uh, stopping the effort with other grade levels, of course, but I think that uh, needs to be voiced and put out there in the ether so that people understand that. Uh, part of our effort included in that uh, is uh, offering to support teacher in the acquisition of their 1316 or 316, mm -hmm. uh, uh, their um, reading teacher license in the district. We have many, many teachers taking advantage of that opportunity. Uh, we also are uh, working on standards-based learning um, in the district. Uh, our elementary schools have been um, you know, on the, the forefront of this for quite some time. You've heard uh, Stacy Everson talk about this. Uh, at the secondary level. Uh, I'm going to read you some names because Stacy will be the first person to tell you that uh, she's not championing this effort alone. She's selfless in that regard. Uh, but let me just, again, put these names out there. Uh, Ruth Bardseth, Jill Emmerich, Christy Holinka, Kate Keeney, Jen Voigt, Kim Novak, and others. Uh, but uh, the district has a lot of champions around this effort. And we believe uh, that we're, grade, we're going to be grading for learning. And the grading portion is what takes up the lion's share of people's attention. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are talking about uh, more than just um, standards-based grading. Okay, we're talking about standards-based learning, which encompasses uh, a variety of elements, including when you uh, adopted and approved the annual academic standards earlier tonight, uh, priority learning standards which simply means we've got some areas we're focusing on for mastery learning. It doesn't mean we're not teaching all these standards, it just means we've got some areas of focus that we want students to learn to mastery. And then finally, I would just tell you that um, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about this pandemic, right? We've had some interruption and some learning. Uh, and to the point brought up earlier about uh, the professional development necessary for things like uh, our code, etc. cetera. Um, we're, we've got a whole child approach that we're focusing on in the school district or across. And so that includes social emotional learning, uh, resilient trauma informed teaching, mental health supports. And uh, we're very fortunate in the school district or across uh, because we were able to uh, bring in what we're calling student success coaches. Uh, student success coach on the academic side and the behavior side. Uh, to help with accelerating some learning for students who we know had some interrupted learning over the last 15 months. And so uh, we understand that that's very real, but again, we're taking a whole child approach uh, in that we know that um, we've got some students who were uh, put in a very spongy, uneven situation uh, over the last uh, so many months. And so uh, we've got a few years here with a pretty unique situation. We're going to be following some metrics closely to try to accelerate learning for students. Uh, and so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, as mentioned here at the beginning, um, that uh, I think Patty mentioned it actually, we're gonna be bringing all of these back. Um, it's a piece of uh, evidentiary piece for OE11, which according to GC6E, we're gonna be bringing back in September. And I will tell you that OE is substantial. It's a significant one. So we'll have to uh, buckle in for that one. and. Uh, we'll be here for a little bit with OE11. But having said that, I'll, I'll answer any questions with this kind of broad overview of uh, these four major instructional priorities going into this next school year. Questions from the board? Can I just like, ask a question about one of the links in the document Please. that you provided? Because I was able to um, access the one to like the strategic plan we've seen in the larger document that you referenced. And I just want to make sure that I'm looking at the right thing because when I click on the other piece that um, was hyperlinked was the professional development piece on that. And if the document that's attached to that is the one we're supposed to be looking at, it's fairly blank. There's, 
I'm, I'm not, if there are links in there, I'm not able to access any. Am I looking at the right thing? It shouldn't be blank. I don't know if it's a, if it's a victim of our slow internet tonight. <laughs> I'm uh, getting the same thing. It's, I think the internet. Yeah. <laughs> But what I will tell you, okay. Dr. <laughs> what I will tell you, Dr. Cooperstall, is that is the associated staff development plan to the strategic plan, and uh, give lots of credit to our, our supervisor of educator readiness, Kelly Schmitz, and her team putting that together. Um, but it is going to be um, a, truly a, a wondrous uh, plan aligned with our strategic plan. Mm -hmm. I will take your word for that because I can't <laughs> actually. I, honestly, I was like, if this is the plan, we yeah, we got a long way to go. I'm okay, sorry. so it's just that it's not coming up. There's, okay. there's tabs when it does come yes. up. There's okay. tabs for each of those categories. I did the same thing. Okay. <laughs> I do see it on Patty's screen, and it's glorious. <laughs> <laughs> it's purple and everything. I mean, it's got colors. <laughs> I just want to Please. comment. I really appreciate the, the way the instructional priorities are laid out, and, and they're easy to read. And there's a lot of good stuff in there, stuff that we've talked about, and, and uh, just a, a nice summary of, of, of the, the goals that we're, we're already uh, district working on. So uh, I appreciate that. Thank you for that, Mr. Gorberg. At this point, the they should be aligned to all of those documents and things that have come before this. So it, it, you should see alignment, and it, and it should be up. That's what the board has been talking about and the superintendent's been talking about. So there shouldn't be any surprises at this late stage. Any other comments? I appreciate the work that you took to condense that. That's oftentimes a, a, a challenge, not so much the expansion, but getting that into a more synthesized mm -hmm. version. Appreciate that. I think the only comment I have is that I appreciate the student-centered approach that we've taken uh, with instructional priorities, and also, uh, Mr. Teff, with the um, with the uh, student handbook. I really appreciate the fact that um, for the student handbook, students are involved in the conversation, and that we can hear directly from them. I think it's important for them to take ownership uh, in some way. Uh, but I also appreciate the re-engaging in schooling on this priority. I think that is a key piece, especially given what we've experienced uh, in knowing what students have gone through and what we have gone through individually. But that re-engagement piece, I think, is so critical, and so I appreciate the work in putting that in. So thank you for that. Any other comments before we move on? Okay. Hearing none, then uh, we will move on to our announcements. Uh, Ms. Bauman is not here, so we do not have an uh, update from the Public Education Foundation. Uh, the only thing I have for my announcements is a reminder that any proposed resolutions uh, for WASB will, should be reviewed as information at our next board meeting, and then submit, we will submit proposals to the board secretary, uh, Ms. Galvan, by August 12th, and then they'll be reviewed at our final meeting in August before um, they can be submitted and meet the deadline of September 15th. So if we have any proposals or proposed resolutions, could you please get those in? We would appreciate that. Okay. Moving on, we'll go to the announcements by Superintendent Nagel. Let's have a few announcements. Uh, first, uh, we finished our last community facility planning meeting last week, Wednesday. Um, good feedback from a, a wide range of community members um, and some resulting uh, media uh, from that. So been good conversation. Look forward to continuing that. We have uh, specific focus groups with the Chamber of Commerce and the City of La Crosse coming up. So and look forward to that feedback as well. And then we anticipate a workshop the second meeting in August to kind of discuss the survey that will be drafting to put out. So we should have a draft of that to discuss at that time. Um, legislative update. The governor signed the biennium that was sent to him with some uh, minor line item vetoes. Um, Ms. Sprang can add any additional detail, but not really a lot of additional money for education in this biennium. There's no per pupil uh, increase. So that will affect our revenue limit. And uh, what they did do to meet the funding requirements so that we don't lose the ESSER funds 
was to increase the general aid. So the general aid, as you know, the revenue limit is made up of the general aid plus the local taxes. And so if they do not increase the revenue limit, but they increase the general aid, it decreases the local property taxes. It does not mean any more money for our students. So. Yeah, so we'll be navigating that as we move forward. There was a commitment to increase reimbursement for special education services, but it's, a, it's not a sum sufficient amount. It is variable, so it's unlikely in this first year at least that we'll see any increase in reimbursement for special education services. Um, so we'll be looking at our budget as we move forward. Um, you know, our budget, given our declining enrollment, isn't as greatly impacted in the first year as it might have been, but it will be very impactful in the second year. Uh, and so we'll be giving you more information as we uh, figure out the specific details of that this summer. Um, and then start of the 21-22 school year. First day of school was last week Thursday for Northside and for Hamilton. It was a wonderful day. It's my favorite day of the school year. Kids got off of buses and walked to school and had a great day. Um, of course, we're still in the middle of a pandemic and we're still addressing uh, COVID cases. Uh, throughout the beginning part of the summer, cases were very low, uh, down to zero many days in the, over the last over a seven day average in the, the La Crosse County. So that was very exciting. We're starting to see an uptick. We're starting to see more of the Delta variant, which is much more transmissible. Um, we're encouraging everyone to get vaccinated. That is the number one thing we can do to limit spread and keep our schools open. And while we haven't had masks for the last uh, couple of months, um, you know, we're looking at what are the thresholds that we would meet to reinstate that. You know, the CDC has made recommendations for unvaccinated folks to be wearing masks at school. Uh, the Association of Pediatrics, American Association of Pediatrics, indicated that they recommend all people to wear masks regardless. So we're taking that into account. But we've been following the Harvard Growth. Harvard Global Health Institute's recommendations since last July, you know, which has a threshold at which you might not wear masks and social distance, and that's set at one case per day. So that's something that we're looking at as well. We'll be providing some updates here um, this week to you all and our parents about what our expectations are. We want students to have access to school. We want them to have the best possible learning environment, and we know that that's generally best in person. So anything we can do to keep kids at school, we're going to try and pursue. So um, we can anticipate that somebody will be unhappy <laughs> in the near future as we probably look at wearing masks when it makes sense and occasionally not wearing masks if it makes sense, you know, in various settings. And so we'll be navigating that same terrain we did this whole last year. But we want to follow the advice of experts and the science and do what's right to protect our children. So Construction. How is transportation going with construction around like Northside where Gillette Street is closed in Hamilton? So I'm just wondering if, if everything's going okay because of that, if it's creating chaos with driving or... I have not heard any specific uh, complaints. Uh, Shelley's indicating that she hasn't heard anything specific. There's construction everywhere right now. You can't drive anywhere without finding a detour. It's nice, I get to experience new parts of the city. Um, but uh, it hasn't been a, a major hindrance. And Northside and Hamilton have a lot of kids that walk. So it's, it's been relatively easy for them to navigate those detours. And then they get to see awesome construction equipment everywhere they go. So it's just really exciting for kids. All right. That's Thank all I have. Thank you, Dr. Engel. We'll move on to the agenda planning. I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda for uh, August 2nd, 2021 Board of Education meeting with any additions or corrections. Second. 
Motion has been made by Mr. Korberg, seconded by Ms. Como to approve the August 2nd, 2021 Board of Education agenda with any additions or corrections. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion has carried. Uh, we'll move on to our board debriefing. I'll turn it over to Dr. Cooper Stoll. Thank you, Dr. Jimenez. So the board debriefing, as you know, tends to focus around a few key questions. The first one being, what are things that we did um, well uh, tonight? And I would say that um, from my perspective, there's been some good discussion around um, agenda items for this evening. It's nice to have questions and comments from board members here who are present. Um, and so, um, and we've stayed on task where that was that was concerned. Um, with regards to what didn't work well for us or things we can improve on, I think it's rare that we have a board meeting where we have so, where we're missing a number of, of board members, but I think when they're not here, it's felt, obviously, mm -hmm. because uh, we, we miss out on some of that feedback, and, and that can't be uh, helped at times, and I'm saying that even though in August I can't be here. Um, but I would say that that's one thing that, uh, I, I think we I think we do really well when everyone is here and able to, to contribute. So I think that um, uh, that was just uh, something that we missed out on this uh, this this evening. Um, and I, that would be my feedback. I would offer it up if there were any other comments uh, people wanted to add to what we did well or what we can improve on. I think we can improve on the internet. Oh, well, yeah. Oh, I forgot. I was asked. I was, it was suggested that I include. And what we did well are patience and flexibility in navigating the meeting in terms of the limitations of the internet. Yes. Being in IT, I totally understand. It was a 100% joke. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you guys. Other comments from the other board members? I think the only things I would have is... I would echo both items. First, that I, it was a great conversation had with the board, and um, I, I love the, the energy that happens when we get to those points where we're um, involved in those deep conversations on things. So thank you to everybody around the table. And then also to our IT department, it is, it's got to be a challenge uh, to, to worry about internet issues, but yes, uh, we totally understand, and we are so grateful for the work that you all do. So thank you for that. With that, then I think we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.